<laughs> so I'm Antti Auhianen uh, from Pericom, Finland, uh, and I think Thomas did amazing job with, with his, I think it was pretty exactly 30 minutes, um, and I'm trying to do the same. Um, there's my Twitter handle if someone wants to check out, but it's mostly in Finnish. I'm going to use just a sh short time, like one and a half minutes to explain, like Pericom Finland is our, uh, um, is a think tank working in Finland. We mostly do stuff in Finnish. Um, we've written a book called The Welfare State Strikes Back, um, which is about the future economy. Uh, we did interviews with uh, Michael Albert, Robin Hanel, Noam Chomsky, Julia Chor, and uh, other experts from United States, where we discussed how and why the welfare state should be brought forward. Uh, then there's an article from New York Times, which we did with Joanna, and we did also another article to New York Times about the universal basic income model, which might be an interesting thing to talk about today in the question and answer session. Um, here are three books that I strongly recommend, uh, and all three are books that I've uh, helped translate into Finnish. And all uh, uh, are about global alternatives to capitalism. Uh, they are by Michael Albert and Robin Hanel, two of the founders of the Paris Ecom model. Um, so, um, why the alternative? I think Thomas already pretty much nailed it. Um, and when you see um, headlines like this on Financial Times, you sort of um, you sort of know that that an alternative is needed. But the problem is that you know people are very good at dissing capitalism. People are very good at uh, telling about what's wrong with capitalism. Um, but the alternative is, um, is a bit tougher spot. So what I thought to do with my 27 minutes or so that I have left um, is to talk about the alternatives. Um, and I come from one alternative. And this is something that people, I don't think, often recognize that capitalism has been a failure from the start. Capitalism is one of, one of the worst economic systems we've had. Um, and the failure is evident uh, from how people have always opposed it. People, ever since the conception of contemporary capitalism in the 17th century or so, um, people were very strongly against it. And labor movements, people's movements, and all sorts of organized uh, movements of people have always opposed capitalism, because capitalism destroys nature, because capitalism uh, destroys um, societal values, because capitalism breaks the bonds that keep us together. Is the translation not working? OK. Okay. I can take something out so it doesn't take too long. Um, so, yeah, okay, yeah. Translation. Okay. Okay, I can go back. No problem. Uh, okay, five minutes more. Whoa, that's generous. Um, so, um, Maybe to sum it up in two minutes. Um, capitalism is an economic system that creates problems. Uh, it's very good at that. For, uh, capitalist system creates a lot of stuff. Some of it is good, some of it is very useful, but a lot of it is very problematic. And that is one of the reasons why capitalism has always been opposed or feature of, of capitalism. If you are a proponent of capitalism or a supporter of capitalism, of course, you would argue that uh, they are just small bits and uh, problems within the wonderful economic system. Uh, but if you are an anti-capitalist like me, uh, then you recognize that, for example, uh, the climate crisis that we are in the middle of 
or actually the problems that capitalism creates between inequali uh, inequal inequality between people or creating the so uh, or destroying the social bonds between people within the, uh, with the market exchange are problems enough to show us that we need alternatives and I come from Finland, and Finland is a welfare state, a uh, social democratic welfare state, and that is one of the most successful uh, models of anti-capitalism we have seen. Many proponents of social democracy uh, view social democracy as something that actually helps capitalism and makes it you know, even better. Um, and it's a sort of funny trick to do, to uh, claim that, that actually the achievements of social democracy are achievements of capitalism, like rise in living standards and uh, healthcare and so on. Uh, but the fact remains that the roots of the labor movement, the roots of the social democratic movement, stem from fighting capitalism and trying to correct the problems that it has. Trying to help uh, mothers uh, have a livable income at home, trying to help elderly people have um, have standard of living uh, without market, uh, or helping uh, workers negotiate better prices and better uh, rights for themselves. And they are all part of the tradition of the social democratic movement. And I think it is a wonderful step towards a better economy than the one that capitalism provides. Um, but I think we really should be moving forward from that. Uh, we already have welfare states, and welfare states have suffered uh, from serious problems with stagnation um, and even regression in many countries. Uh, and social democratic uh, welfare state is far cry from being any sort of global model yet. Um, so I think social democratic welfare state is something we should be moving towards to uh, whilst implementing very strict uh, climate standards. But like Thomas, I'm going to focus strictly on uh, the economy. I'm not going to shy away from climate, but when talking about global alternatives, I'm going to talk only about the economy. So, um, and better than social democracy would be market socialism. That would give us more democracy in the economy. And I'm going to explain a Swedish idea about uh, worker welfare funds called the Meidner model in very short terms. And lastly, I'm going to talk about full democratic planning of the economy, which I think is the desirable uh, path to which I think global economy should be headed. Um, so I think I'm going to skim through these because I hope people know a lot about this already. But current social democracy and the welfare state, they use political representative democracy to rein in the excesses of capitalism. And these are all something that many European countries have. Uh, many third world countries start, start, uh, tried to fight for in the 60s and 70s um, and were very severely punished for it by, by uh, mainly uh, United States led uh, militaries. Um, and the main uh, participation for citizens is through representative democracy and politics, labor unions and NGOs. And this is a very limited model of democracy, partly like, for example, what Thomas talk, talked about. It's important to understand that even this, you know, the most democratic, most uh, free form of uh, democratic capitalism we have, or capitalism, uh, is still very limited. Um, and the challenges are that there's still hierarchy in the workplace. There's immense inequality between empowering a manual labor and level of education or wealth are still hereditary, mostly hereditary even in Finland with even we have, you know, very strong uh, wealth transfers and free public school, free university. But when you look at statistics, you still see that it's the same families that go to universities um, and wealth is still very much inherited. So a better model. Um, and this is something that Swedish economist Rudolf Meiner created a proposal. And that is that uh, through paying small amounts of, of their wages, uh, the wage earners will create uh, very large national funds that allow them to effectively buy shares 
and own shares of their own workplaces. Uh, and through that, increase the decision making of workers. And Meitner thought that uh, cooperatives that the workers themselves own should be the basis of a democratic economy. Um, and those companies would still compete within a marketplace, but the workers themselves would own it. Uh, and this is an interesting historical thing, this Meitner model, because it was talked about in the 50s and 60s in Denmark, in Germany, uh, and in Norway, and in Sweden. But unfortunately, it wasn't implemented at, at the end. Um, um, it was uh, reformed and diluted in many ways. Uh, Sweden and Finland, for example, created very big um, worker funds, wage earner funds, uh, whose value is in, in billions of euros today. Uh, but they are mostly used to pay off um, retirement benefits to workers, which in itself is an achievement. But unfortunately, it, unfortunately, it doesn't increase democracy or worker empowerment, workers say, in what they do at the workplace at all. Um, so, is it possible to have an economy without markets? Um, and I know this is a tricky question which I'm not going to go fully into today. Um, but I'm going to sh show one possible model that theoretically could uh, provide answers um, to, for example, climate crisis and could create uh, much better um, signals, uh, price signals is what the economists call it, uh, to the economy so that, for example, we could tackle crises like climate crisis much faster than is possible in uh, capitalism. And I think also in Pat Devine's model, which Thomas, I think, very well uh, showed. So the idea of democratic planning is that uh, everyone should have a say to decisions in proportion um, to how those decisions affect them. Um, and it means that instead of markets, we have a system of democratic planning where uh, consumers and producers, people living in neighborhoods, and companies and cooperatives uh, do a plan, like what they're going to do, and then agree on that uh, so that the economy can move forward. Uh, and do that continuously so that the price signals, that how much things uh, cost, can be affected by consumers directly. That is, that for example, if there are indigenous people living in a mining area, just by living there, they have a right to say that this mine should cost this and this much, or they could even use veto and say that they will not allow mining there. This is the basic idea in, in a democratic economy. And it also means focus, uh, sh shifting the focus from private ownership to access rights. Because private ownership um, is something that effectively creates deadlocks all around the economy. Uh, deadlocks that are only negotiated not through democratic means, but through brute power, that is wealth. So private ownership is actually a very big theoretical problem, but also, of course, an immense, um, immense actual problem in, in our societies. Uh, because preferably, in a democratic economy, in a democratic society, we should be able to discuss that things, even if you own something, but if it destroys other people, or, or if, if it uh, blocks other people from gaining uh, considerable societal benefits, uh, we should have a democratic discussion about it and create a better solution. Um, Another focus is democratic enterprises, that in a democratic economy, uh, we should have democracy everywhere. Uh, British writer George Monbiot has written very well, I think, about how in today's economy, when you go to work, uh, you basically, you know, you leave your citizenship rights at the door and enter a tyranny where the boss can basically, for example, command you not to go to the toilet. Um, 
so um, or you don't have any voting rights, you don't have rights to the like how things are presented at your workplace, you don't have rights to how shifts are created and, and so on. Um, so one basic idea, and this is also very much, I think, in most market socialist ideas for a democratic economy, that workplace should be democratic. Um, I'm not going to go in detail with these. Um, one important thing, and this relates to climate crisis, is that enterprises should receive resources dep uh, depending on supply and demand. And this is something that Thomas actually uh, mentioned, because he said that how we produce and what we produce currently are decided by market value. An actual planned democratic economy is all about focusing on the societal value. So that through the democratic planning, we create new supply and demand, not based on wealth, but based on what people actually want, what they see as beneficial, or what they see as harmful. And all that should affect the prices of what is produced, or even block something from being produced. If enough people say that we should stop mining cobalt because it, first of all, creates problems at the mining place, and secondly, it's a resource that's about to end, uh, then we should, have, we should have systems set up, like the ones present in the model of participatory planning uh, or Paricon, um, where we can decide that this is too destructive for us to do, even though it would create benefit it doesn't create enough benefit. Uh, the current economy suffers from the very similar problem that the uh, Soviet economies, uh, centrally planned economies, suffered from, which is that this decision, what is beneficial, is made actually by a very small group of people. In the Soviet economy, it was the people uh, at Kosplan, the, uh, the people in Moscow, uh, the central planners who had a vision for the economy and they just implemented it. Um, how is this similar to, to today? Well, um, I have friends working as bankers in London uh, and I hear stories from big financiers in New York and it's actually a very small group of people. If there's like a group of 30 usually men uh, who hold assets worth in hundreds of billions of euros, uh, they can easily make decisions that affect even billions of people. Uh, and they can easily make smaller decisions that still are impossible for people to do, even if those must much uh, poorer people collectively join, say, millions of people together, then they still don't have as much leverage as this small group of finance investors. Um, and this wrecks up the supply and demand in capitalist economy. And this, uh, this tension always exists in capitalist economies. And in a democratic economy, we should be able to have a network of, co uh, of democratic corporations, democratic companies, a network of neighborhoods, network of municipalities, a network of, <laughs> I don't like to say states, but a network of areas, larger areas, um, that together negotiate and together send what they want produced and what they need to consume. Um, and globally, um, yeah, I'm going to say one thing before this. I think I still have time, yeah. Um, the other thing is that today when there's a lot of talk about climate change, for a very good reason. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes I hear that people wish that we would have some sort of like, for example, that IPCC could just command that we, we implement climate plans and so on. Um, and well, uh, to some extent, uh, because the current situation is so disastrous, um, some of those, you know, that we should have intergovernmental really big organization that can just, you know, hammer down some sort of proposal, we will definitely need those. Um, but in the future, I think, to prevent crises like this, we should really move towards a democratic economy where scientists can prov uh, provide input to the democratic uh, planning.
but also areas where people live, like local neighborhoods, can immediately say that, you know, this factory that you're building is destroying our water, this, um, uh, this uh, project that you're planning is destroying our holy sites or our forests, um, and actually make that uh, information available to the economy itself uh, in a democratic way. Uh, for, uh, you know, um, wake that so that that it's much stronger if those people actually live there. Because one of the uh, uh, reasons that climate uh, crisis has been able to go this far is that many areas in third world countries have been possible to destroy completely uh, by inter uh, by multinational companies because the people living there are so poor. And democracy is something, global democracy is something that could uh, provide uh, stable answers to those problems. Um, and that is, that is why I think that we seriously should be moving towards global alternatives. I know that it will take generations of, of people to build such, such actual alternatives. But I think it is a big flaw not to talk about it, not to create a vision that actually you know, gives us hope that in the future we as a humanity can create a much more stable, much more free society that is at peace with nature. Uh, and I think the idea of democratic economy is something that can inform actual economic research and actual political reforms and political movements about how to move towards that. And why this, why such you know, elaborate scheming or, or thinking around a simple thing? <coughs> well, the reason is capitalism. Capitalism is a really devious uh, economic system, and it always gives uh, the play, play chips, playing chips and the loudspeaker to those with most wealth. Um, and that's why the global movements that are trying to build a more democratic future are always at a disadvantage in a capitalist system. Um, and that's why I think that we really need to talk about changing the system itself at some point. I'm not proposing any sort of like, you do something in one day or anything like that. That would be disastrous, obviously. But I think we should sort of together as movements decide that capitalism is a serious problem. We need to rein it in and, you know, make, disable it as much as we can. Um, but at the same time, I think enough of us hope that we could have an economy, a democratic economy without capitalism at all, that we should start seriously working on that and talk about alternatives to that and do research and do small scale experiments about non-market uh, alternatives to capitalism. So um, here are some pointers for consideration that I think might be interesting uh, for the audience to talk about. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm happy to answer anything related to these or our work in Finland as well. Thank you very much.